And now I'm very excited to introduce Claire, who is just, this book is a triumph. I mean, it's, we're so excited to have her share a recipe today from this. And like, Claire is just a enormously talented pastry chef, home cook, just skilled recipe developer. And it's really, yeah, it's really an honor to have her here sharing your talents with us today. So I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sierra. And thank you, Natasha. Um, I'm super excited to be here for a lot of reasons. Um, first and foremost, to support God's Love, which is an incredible organization. And like Sierra said, she and I are both like local in New York um, and God's Love is such an important sort of pillar of the community in New York. Um, and I recently had the pleasure of taking a tour of the facility, which is so impressive. And I got to see those personalized birthday cakes that they make for all of the clients. And it is just, it, it's an expansive organization that also manages to be so personal. Um, and so it's really a pleasure and privilege for me to support them and to have all of you here following along. And of course it's like, Sorry, I have a light that like flickers off and on. So sorry, that might get annoying. Um, hopefully it doesn't like strobe. Um, we're in prime holiday baking season right now. And so I'm really excited to bake this recipe from Dessert Person along with you. But like Sierra said, um, I'm here to answer any of your holiday baking questions or baking questions in general. So use the chat, as she said, and Sierra will be talking with me and asking me questions as I go along. And I, I know at least some of you are baking this recipe like simultaneously we're going to do some synchronized baking which is super exciting and i'm going to use this phenomenal great jones cake pan to make it which i just realized i'm like christmas themed with the green pan and the red sweatshirt. so um i'm just really excited so i'm going to get started because we have some baking to do and it's also i just love that this is sort of like early on saturday and it's really cold and kind of gross outside in New York. And it's just like, I'm in my sweats and my socks and very excited about turning on the oven. Um, so, okay, I wanna say thank you and happy holidays. And now I'm gonna start. So the recipe that we selected is from Dessert Person and it is for a pear and chestnut cake. And this is from my favorite chapter in the book, which is the loaf cake and single layer cakes chapter. Just because these are the kind of casual, any time of day cakes that I love to have around and that I love to make. And most of them feature some kind of seasonal fruit. So obviously it's fall or, you know, really winter um, and pears in season. So here is the cake. So this is kind of like a close up shot. So there's pear slices on top and then chestnuts and chopped up pear in the cake. And it's really easy and fun to make. You will need a stand mixer. So I'll just say that. You could make it with a hand mixer if you had one. Oops. Sorry, my stand mixer has like a hair trigger when you turn it on, so it accidentally turns on all the time. Uh, okay, so I have all the ingredients ready. Hopefully you do too. Um, they're mostly measured out, but I'll also take my time and go slowly if you have to measure everything out. But it's always a good idea to start with your, what we call mise en place. So pulling all of your ingredients down, making sure you have the correct pan, all of your measuring cups, all of that. So hopefully you can see if at any point you like don't have a good view of something, you can put it in the chat and Sierra can let me know. Um, and I'll show you, I'll tilt the camera down. You know, sorry, you guys are all in my Zoom. So I'll see what I can do about the frame. Um, okay, you'll notice if you've made anything out of dessert person that every recipe starts the same way, which is it will tell you to prepare your pan and preheat your oven. So that's what I'm gonna do first. So I have an oven rack in the center position. Anytime you're baking one thing, you always bake in the center. That's just for even baking. Oops, I literally had like a strobe light, sorry. Um, and then we're gonna prepare the pan. So the recipe in the book calls for a skillet, but it also works great in a cake pan like this. So this is the Great Jones nine inch. What was it, the patty pan? What is it called, patty cake, right? Okay. Claire. Um, if someone is using a cast iron pan, do they need to adjust the baking temperature? No, same temperature. The timing might be a little bit different. It could, depending on the dimensions, if you're baking in something that's wider and therefore your cake is a little bit thinner, it could cake, bake a little bit faster. But we'll, we always start checking a little early, so not to worry. Um, but so 350 is our temp, um, which is sort of like the, the standard, you know, go-to baking temperature for most cakes. 
And so great, these, the Great Jones pan has these little wavy lines at the bottom, which at first glance seem just really fun and decorative, but also help to prevent sticking on the very bottom. Um, but I'm gonna line it with parchment paper anyway, just as an extra precaution, because I just think like, you know, what you really don't wanna happen is to have your cake stick in the pan. And so it's always good to have an insurance policy. Can you so, use a food processor if, for the chestnuts and creaming if you don't have a mixer? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. Uh, good question. So this cake is pear and chestnut. These are two ingredients that come into season at the same time. This is a time of year where you will see chestnuts at the market. Um, and I have done the thing where I bought actual whole chestnuts and like roasted them and peeled them. And it's a huge pain in the ass and I'm never doing it again. So what I do instead is I buy like jars or bags of them. So here are some that I have left over. If they come in a jar like this or in a little bag with a little zip top and like they're pretty much ready to go. So I have all of that here. And then I know I'll get back to the pan in a second, but um, I have some really tiny pears. So I have four instead of three, but just go ahead and weigh them out. It's about a little over a pound total of fruit. And I call for pears that are firm ripe, which just means like it's not super soft, but it will yield, you know? So it's, I'll get a clean cut. It's not mushy, but it is a pear that if you were to eat it, you would enjoy it because it was, it's ripe enough. What okay. about if someone is yeah. using walnuts instead of chestnuts? Is if that you're using walnuts, if you're using walnuts, walnuts are relatively good swap in terms of like a nut alternative because they're pretty soft then you're going to really want to do that part of the food processor to break them up. Um, you know, chestnuts are an interesting nut because they're very soft. Like they have, um, I just saw someone say also pecans. You could also use pecans, but like these will break up really easily. I could just smush them between my hands, whereas other nuts don't have that same moisture content. Um, so if you're using any nut as a substitute, you're going to want to do that initial step of mixing the chestnuts or nut and sugar together in the food processor. Um, okay, but let's quickly do the pan. So I have some butter here that's room temp in addition to the room temp butter that I'm using in the recipe, which is 10 tablespoons. And I'm gonna give, I like to use a pastry brush. You could use your fingertips. You could use the paper from the butter, which I do often. Um, and I'm just gonna give a generous coating of butter in the bottom and sides of the pan. So get it all around. And then once you have a good coating, and I like to use, you could use melted butter and it's okay if it was still warm. You could use like, you know, if you have like Pam or something, a spray, you could use that as well. And now I put a round of parchment paper on the very bottom. So not up the sides, but just like a circle that's the same size as the pan. And to do that, you can either trace the pan. I have like a, a, a Sharpie or a pen that I keep in my kitchen. You can trace around it, or you can do this trick, which I'll show you, which is take your piece of parchment paper and fold it like into a half, like a triangle, the long ways, and then just continue to fold that triangle in half, making like subsequently, you know, smaller and smaller triangles so that you have a point. And then once you get it pretty thin, I'll show you what this looks like. So I have, like I keep folding along this edge and so I have this point here. I'm going to basically line up the center of that point with the center of the pan. I'll go even closer to you. And then where I see the edge line up with the triangle, I'm gonna snip. And I'm really just trying to make something that has like the same radius as the pan and like eyeball it's fine. Usually I end up cutting it a little too small or a little too big, but it really doesn't matter. So I snipped it and then when you unfold, you have this round. And because I buttered it, it's gonna stick. Oh, so like I cut this one too small, it doesn't matter. Uh, so then just go ahead, smooth that in. I try to eliminate any air bubbles. Because we buttered it, it will stick. And then go ahead and give a little brush of butter onto that parchment. You can be generous, always. 
And then one thing I like to do with cakes is give like a coating of sugar all around that pan. And I just like it because it adds some crunch and a little bit of texture and of course a little bit of extra sweetness. So um, use granulated sugar, that's what the recipe calls for, but I also just had like an odds and end bag of this like more you know, natural cream sugar, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so I threw in a handful, just, I don't know, this part's kind of fun. Just like move it around, tap it, get some sugar coating around the sides as well. Um, Yes, if you are concerned about sticking or you don't have extra sugar or you don't want to add the extra sugar, you could also flour it and that will further prevent sticking as well. Okay, so that's our prepped pan. I can throw that off to the side. And now let's talk about cake, cake mise en place and cake prep. So this recipe, as I said, gets built in a stand mixer. If you're substituting another nut for the chestnuts, go ahead and start the recipe in the food processor to really grind everything. But because chestnuts are so soft, I can do this part in the stand mixer and they will all break down. So the idea of this cake is it's flavored with this subtle earthy flavor of chestnuts. And that is kind of like ground up into a paste along with the sugar. And then it's studded with chopped up pear and then pear slices on top. So it's a really lovely, subtle cake um, with that also gets great moisture from the addition of delicious creme fraiche, which I have right here. So I have my eggs, butter, you know, these are all the usual suspects when it comes to um, cake ingredients besides the chestnuts and the fruit. So the first thing I'll do is mix up my dry ingredients. I have one and a third cups of all-purpose flour in this bowl right here. And to that, I'm gonna add what we call the chemical leavener. So that is baking powder, two teaspoons of baking powder. So add that right into the bowl. And now I'm also gonna add a little bit of baking soda, often in a recipe that has an acidic ingredient. In this case, that acidic ingredient is creme fraiche there will sometimes be a little bit of baking soda added and that just gives the cake a little bit of extra lift because if you remember back to your second grade science project where you made the volcano and you like did the baking soda and vinegar, baking soda reacts with acid and creates bubbles and gas. So a quarter teaspoon of baking soda as well. All right, so whisk that all together and this is just to get all those dry ingredients dispersed and evenly mixed and then that helps you have a more evenly mixed cake in the end. So I'll set that aside. Bring in some of these other guys. What mixer attachment are you using? Ah, excellent question. So I'm going to use the paddle which is really used for like beating and mixing whereas the whisk attachment is really for whipping and incorporating air although the paddle and the paddle like the action of the paddle against the bowl really kind of like cr crushes things and beats it against the side of the bowl and that's why we use that for that creaming step in cake making so in most cake making the first step is what's called creaming you mix the butter and sugar together and what happens is and, and I'll show you the sugar crystals have like sharp edges and they create little micro air pockets in the butter. Uh, and that those air pockets, that makes that mixture really light and fluffy. And then that is giving the cake like an airiness and a lift and stuff. So you get that fluffy cake texture. If you don't have, I just saw a question, if you don't have creme fraiche, you can use sour cream, you can use full fat yogurt, that's all good. Okay, so before I start actually building the cake and putting together the batter, I'm gonna prep my pears. So let me move these things out of the way. Can you guys see the pears on my surface? Should I move a little closer? Okay. So these are Bartlett pears. You could use Bosque, you could use Anjou, you could use Comis. It's really up to you, whatever you like. Um, I like Bartlett because they're kind of pretty and they have, like this one has a little blush of red on it. Um, so they're kind of festive for holidays. So I'm gonna slice three of them and chop up one of them. The chopped up one is gonna go inside the cake in the batter. So when I cut anything like pear or apple I, with a core, I cut down alongside the core. So 
instead of cutting through it and then removing it, I just cut off to the side a little bit and remove what I call lobes of fruit. And then you're left with just like this little core, which I sometimes like nibble on. And then that's what you've got. So this first one I'm gonna chop up. Don't, I, I couldn't care in the least about the shape of what you're chopping, like cubes, whatever, can be pretty coarse with it. And I think this, my pear is a good level of ripeness. I probably bought these like on Wednesday and they've been softening ever since. So they're not mushy. I can still get clean cuts, but like it's tender still. So. Okay, and then once I chopped up the one pear, I'm gonna slice the others. And now I'll be a little bit more careful with the slicing on these because these will be decorative on top. So same method of removing the fruit from that center core. And do all of them at once. You kind of go, even when you're just making one single thing, efficiency is always good. So like, you know, take, cut off all the cores, then slice all the fruit at the same time. So now I have all these different sort of size lobes. Some of them are like, you know, a full side of the fruit. Some of them are, are thinner. And now I'm gonna slice them all thinly lengthwise. So down from what would be like the top, the stem end to the base. And the idea is to get even pretty slices. And I like cutting it this way because it maintains the natural shape of the pear and just makes like the prettiest pattern on top. So as I'm slicing, here's a really good tip. I'm using like a relatively, this knife could be sharper, but use your sharpest knife. This one has a kind of a thin blade and I slice with the tip of the knife, like really from like the first few inches near the tip um, rather than back here. And that's just because the fruit doesn't, like the thinner part of the blade, the fruit doesn't want to stick to. So you don't have to keep like wiping a slice off of the tip of the knife. You can just keep, the fruit stays on the board. You can just keep slicing. So give yourself a few minutes to do this. If for any reason your ingredients are not room temp, which they should be for this cake, so maybe your eggs are a little bit cold or your crab fresh is a little bit cold, while you're cutting the fruit, you can, like actually my crab fresh is kind of cold. I'm gonna put it right by the oven so it can warm up a bit. And your eggs, if those are cold, you can throw them in a little hot water and like cheat it a little bit to get those things ready to go. This part takes a minute or two. And then you can just leave these on the cutting board. So pears will oxidize, oxidize a little bit, but not like an apple where the flesh will turn brown. So I just actually leave all the slices, like after I've cut the fruit, I leave it together. So like this one is sliced but I'm leaving it kind of intact where the, the half you know, maintains its shape. And that helps me when I go to assemble the top of the cake. I like when you can sort of still see that shape and just fan the slices out. Okay, is everyone with me? How's everyone doing? <laughs> Any questions so far? Got some thumbs up. Okay, good. Someone says they're a slow slicer, which I can relate. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to go fast because I'm feeling like I'm taking a long time, but um, you guys don't have to, you can take your time with this, of course. Yeah. Um, slicing, I understand. The other thing is when you're slicing, like especially when you're doing like little slices like that, instead of having your fingers be like this when they hold and then you have the risk of like slicing them off, pretend like you're playing the piano. I don't know if that metaphor resonate, resonates for anyone or like holding your hand in like a little claw shape. And that way, if you slice down, the blade hits the front of your knuckles and your fingers and not your fingertips, which is much more dangerous. So, um, and then just make sure you tuck that thumb out of the way. Thank my you. mom will, my mom will still be like, oh my God, like she'll get nervous. And I'm like, mom, I'm a professional. Like, don't get, I'm, I'm fine. And then I watch her cut and then I start freaking out. I, I, I saw that you dedicated the book to your mom, which was, which I had also noticed that I was using as my bookmarks, these like photos of my mom as a child. So that uh -huh. a lot to me. I'm, I'm curious if you could share 
more about how your mom bakes, what you learned from her. Did you grow up doing this together? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot more just because of that dedication and, and I've been asked about it. And my mom really taught me how to bake. She's a phenomenal baker. And I think at this stage in her life, you know, her kids are all grown up, like she bakes less and less. But when I was a kid, she baked constantly and made a lot of quick breads and cakes and cookies. She went through like a long, a years long phase when I was a kid where she made um, like fresh bread all the time. So that was just always sort of like a, it was almost like wallpaper, you know, in my life a little bit. And I didn't even realize it until later that my mom had such an impressive skill set when it came to baking. Um, so, and she helped me so much with this book. So I just felt like I had to dedicate it to her. Um, and I wanted to do that. And it was, it meant a lot to her. So it was, we bonded a lot over me writing this cookbook, um, which is very, very sweet. Okay, so if you're not done slicing your pears, that's fine, keep going. I'm gonna move on. So the first step I'm gonna do as I keep sort of jumping ahead and talking about is combining the chestnuts and the sugar. And the action of the paddle against the side of the bowl like crushes up and turns those chestnuts into a paste and those sugar crystals, because they're sharp, um, helps to break it all down. So again, for like the 18th time, if you're using regular nuts, pecans, walnuts, whatever it is, do this part in the food processor because just the paddle and the stand mixer won't break down a harder nut on its own. Okay, so that's the sugar. I have the chestnuts, it's 300 grams, which is about two cups. It's three quarters of a cup of sugar. And that's separate from the sugar in the pan and also separate from the two tablespoons of sugar that I'm holding back for the very top of the cake. So to help break up those chestnuts, I'm also gonna add my salt to this. I did not add it to the dry mixture. So a teaspoon of kosher salt. And if you're an experienced baker and you've made any recipes at a dessert person, you might notice that there's like a slightly larger proportion of salt in a lot of my recipes. And that's because salt is a flavor enhancer. It's there to draw out the flavors of the other ingredients, not necessarily make it salty. I mean, sometimes it's there to make it salty, but usually it's just there to enhance everything. And I like to think that that's important because the recipes have moderate sugar contents. Uh, and so when there's not as much sugar in a recipe, sometimes you need that extra salt to bring it out. Um, and it, so that, that was diamond kosher. Uh, so it's one teaspoon. If you're using Morton's, which is more common in other parts of the country, use half that amount. So about a half teaspoon. Um, okay, so now I'm adding my vanilla. This is, I keep this, I use a lot of vanilla beans. And so I keep this jar that I put, so it's basically vodka and I submerge the empty vanilla beans in here. Um, but I also just pour vanilla extract in here to, to fortify it. So this is just like a very concentrated um, vanilla extract. So two teaspoons. And all that goes in with the chestnuts. So I'm going to start with this mixer on low. And just when I see all those chestnuts start to break up, I can increase the speed a little bit. Okay, so make sure you have everything else ready to go. You saw me measuring out um, the rest of them for like two tablespoons of rum or pear brandy if you have it. I, I like to bake a lot with alcohols like that because it's kind of like um, when you add soy sauce or a fermented ingredient to savory cooking, you're, at, you're taking all of the time and complexity that went into that ingredient and like adding it to, to your cooking to, to increase the flavor. So uh, to me, alcohol, that's what alcohol does in baking. Um, so I'm actually, this is an Armagnac that I'm using, which I love baking with because it's like a little funky. Um, Armagnac is similar to cognac and it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it smells so good and I hate the taste of it, but I like it in baking. Um, all right, so I'm gonna turn up the speed a little bit. So now things are starting to look familiar. We have our egg, our wet ingredients, which our, are the creme fraiche and the alcohol, whatever kind. 
How do you feel about vanilla bean paste? Oh, I love vanilla bean paste. That's a great product. I say go for it. Use the same amount, or maybe you, you can use a little less. Like if you don't want to use two whole teaspoons of that, it's pretty potent. So use that, throw in a teaspoon or so. Um, okay, so this is starting to break up. I'm going to show you what this looks like with my spatula. Here's what the chestnuts look like. It has formed this very coarse paste. Um, and it's really starting to break down. So at this point, I'm gonna add my butter. This is 10 tablespoons of room temperature unsalted butter. Uh, and this time of year, like it actually gets really cold in my kitchen until I turn the oven on. Um, so sometimes I have a hard time actually this time of year with getting the butter really room temperature. Uh, but that's all right. Your, actually, your apartment's always either too cold or way too hot. <laughs> yes, always, always, truly. Um, and the other day, I actually turned on the, uh, if, if I don't, so my radiators are off right now, and if I don't do that, then it becomes stifling, but now it's just freezing, and so the other day, I just turned on my oven because I was cold in the whole oh. oven. Um, <laughs> Can you show us the texture you're looking for from the food processor? Oh, so if you're using, yeah, so in the stand mixer, it's still pretty coarse right now. It almost looks like chunky applesauce. It's not quite as loose, but like that's visually, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, uh, if you're using a food processor, it's up to you. In a food processor, you could get the entire thing totally smooth, where it almost looks like a, like a coarse nut butter. That's fine. You can go there. It's up to you if you want pieces of the nuts in your final cake, which I think are really nice and adds great texture or if you want it totally smooth. Okay, so I added the butter, and now we're kind of entering the creaming stage, where I'm mixing the butter with that chestnut sugar mixture. And I want this to get really light and fluffy. The chestnuts will continue to kind of break down and smooth out a little bit. And it will leave, it'll still leave little pieces of it. I like when you get bite down and you get like a little crumbly piece of chestnut. Um, what if, so, oh yeah. What if you don't drink or want to use alcohol? What else? If you don't want to use, yeah, if you don't want to use alcohol, you could use, um, you could use a little bit more creme fraiche. You could use milk. It's totally fine. You could, if there was like a fruit juice that you wanted to add, uh, you could do that. Um, but like m m milk or almond milk, even like all of any of that's fine. Any any liquid where you don't mind the flavor of it in there, uh, or if you want to just add a little more creme fraiche, that's good too. All right, so I'm gonna let this go, but also give it a little bit of a scrape here, here and there, so you can see after adding that butter, the mixture has like lightened quite a bit in color, in color and in texture. And so I think people in general sometimes undershoot the butter and sugar creaming stage. So you want to really let this go. It's possible to like do it too much. Um, but generally people don't have the patience to get to that point. So I think that the risk is actually pretty low. So the my mixture is on medium high at this stage. You could build this whole cake in the food processor, but if you have the patience and the space to transfer it to a stand mixer or use a hand mixer, then that's probably a good idea. You'll get a little bit more air into the batter that way. So basically you started by breaking down the nuts and the sugar in the food processor, and then you wanna move to the mixer and then just build the rest of the batter that way. Again, if you do the whole thing in the food processor, that's fine, just follow along. It'll still turn out great. All right. So this is looking light and fluffy. Um, so the cake, what I like about this cake is that it marries the subtle flavors of both pear and chestnut. Um, but if you wanted to add a little warm spice, I think it could be really nice in this. So I think I just felt like a little tired of cinnamon because cinnamon isn't everything. Um, but I think cardamom would be a really beautiful accompaniment to these flavors. Cinnamon, if that's 
your favorite spice, even like a little bit of nutmeg or clove, any of those kind of warm spices, I think would go really well in this cake and also just feels very festive for the holidays. So um, if you feel like adding that flavor, um, go ahead and stir that into your dry ingredients here. So if you're using cinnamon, I would add maybe a teaspoon, cardamom, maybe a half a teaspoon, because to me that's a stronger flavor. Um, I'm actually really, really sensitive to nutmeg, so I would not use that much. I would maybe only put like a quarter teaspoon. And clove, clove is even less. Clove is so powerful and I love clove, but like I would do an eighth of a teaspoon of that. It says, it'll be the only thing you can taste if you do too much. Is there any danger of overmixing? There is, but given most people's sand mixers at home, and the fact that like you're probably not walking away and forgetting about it for 10 minutes, you're probably, the risk is low of overbeating. So at this stage, that is, if, at this stage, the risk of overbeating it is low, but once you start to add the dry ingredients, that's when you want to be a little bit more careful about how much you're mixing it. So at that stage, yes. But at the creaming stage, not really. Um, okay, so this is looking really good. It's super light and fluffy. It almost looks like frosting, um, which it sort of is, basically. Um, so now I'm gonna add the eggs. We're moving on to the next phase, which is adding the eggs. I'm gonna slow down the mixer. Don't have it going that high because then you'll like splatter everywhere. So add them one at a time. I crack them into one container, but you know, eggs like hold their shape especially if they're fresh. So even if they're all in one container, you should be able to add them one at a time. And then after you add it and it starts to incorporate, you can go ahead and speed up that mixer a little bit. And same thing if you're using a hand mixer, drop the speed a little bit, add the other one. And then once it's incorporated, you can turn it up. Then go ahead and beat it pretty well. At this stage again, you won't over mix it. Okay. So I give things a scrape really, really often because part of the key to a well-made cake is just even mixing. So like the more scraping down you do in the process before you add the flour, the more even it'll be. And then the, the less mixing you'll have to do once you add the flour. Okay, so now, Moving on to the next stage of the process, we're gonna add the dry ingredients and the wet ingredients. And you've probably noticed this if you've made cakes before and you're sort of familiar with recipe language, is you do that in an alternating order. So you start with dry, you alternate it with the wet, and then you end again with the dry. And the reason for this is because this helps to maintain the emulsion of your batter. So basically what you have in here is an emulsion of fat and eggs and water. If I were to add like all the wet ingredients, for example, at this stage, I would overwhelm the mixture and break the emulsion. And like your cake will still turn out okay. It's all right if your batter is a little bit broken, which basically means you see like little particles suspended in liquid. Um, but by alternating wet and dry, starting and ending with dry, you maintain that emulsion and you'll get the best texture in your final cake. Okay, so I'm going to start on low. Oh, again, low so that I don't like blast myself with a flower plume. And I'm going to add about a third of this mixture. Again, oh my God, see it? It's like, this thing has a mind of its own. Okay. Also, like, eyeball this part. It doesn't really, the exact volume isn't that important. All right, like that was probably more than a third, but whatever. And now I'm gonna add, just when you see the flour disappear, go ahead and add your creme fraiche. I'm gonna talk for one moment about how this is one of my favorite kitchen tools. It is this little tiny, thin, heat-proof spatula that is just like the best thing ever for when you're measuring ingredients into any kind of cup. Then, and then you just scrape it out. This thing is just perfect for it. So I'm gonna add the creme fraiche. 
My creme fraiche is a little bit cold. So what happens when you add a cold ingredient to a batter like this, which is butter based, is like I had, I started with room temp butter, which is what you want in order to be able to incorporate air into it and have this beautiful fluffy texture. But then when you add something cold, like a cold egg or cold dairy, that drops the temperature of the butter and has the potential to then make it, make it firm up again. And you kind of lose that suppleness and that also that emulsion. So that's just to say that like when recipes say, make sure you have all your ingredients from temperature, it's not just saying that to be annoying. Like there's a real logic and reason behind that. Okay, so now still on low. Once I see all that creme fraiche incorporate, I'm gonna add another addition of flour. So it's now half of the remaining flour, which would be a third of the total. And now with the mixer still on low, my other liquid ingredient is two tablespoons of brandy, cognac, rum, whatever you've got, and then my remaining flour. So it was three additions of flour and two additions of liquid so that we always start and end with the dry. Okay, so I like pulse the mixer a lot of, at the end and that's just to sort of like simultaneously make sure I'm not over mixing but also making sure it's well combined. So it's okay if you see some streaks of flour in there, go ahead and still turn off your mixture. I usually end up finishing cake batter by hand. And that's just so I can really get a look inside the bowl and see, is there any butter that's trapped in like a dead zone at the very bottom? Or, you know, is there a clump of flour somewhere in there? So I love, I love a sand mixer, but I also like to have my own sense of what's going on. And so I'll usually finish it by hand. So I'm gonna pop this one out. How's my frame? Can you guys see what I'm doing for the most part? Let me know if you want a close up of anything. Okay, so now just scraping off the paddle. Okay, so like I said, using a flexible spatula, Go ahead and really scrape down those sides and give it a fold. So folding, sometimes I wonder if people understand what folding means because I'm used to saying it, but I also think it's like a kind of a vague, unclear term. Folding means, when you watch Schitt's Creek, that was one of my favorite scenes in Schitt's Creek where Moira tries to explain to Daniel how to fold in the cheese and neither one of them has any idea what they're talking about. Um, and that's what made me think like, do people know what folding means? And it is worth explaining. So folding basically means is a gentle way of mixing. And it means that you're taking what's at the very bottom and you're trying to bring it up to the top. So I'm reaching down with my spatula and then I am lifting up and sort of as I scrape on the side and then there's a rotation of the wrist and a turning and that's taking what's on the bottom and bringing it up to the top. So you see it's like a down, go down around as you're scraping and then uh, and then rotate. And that's all folding is. So is there this a, batter looks, yeah, go ahead. Is there a technical reason behind alternating wet and dry ingredients? That reason is to keep the batter emulsified. So if you were to add all of the liquid, like before adding any flour, um, it would you would basically like overwhelm the emulsion. It's like adding too much oil if you're when you're trying to make mayonnaise in the beginning, and then the whole thing breaks. And then once the emulsion is broken, especially in cake batter, you can't like you can try to add flour to bring it back together, but by alternating them a little bit at a time, you're just maintaining that smooth like fluffy cake batter and not causing it to break. So yes, there is, again, like same thing with room temperature. I think people are so used to seeing that kind of language around cakes that it's easy to question, like, does this really matter? You know, and sometimes there's recipe language that doesn't matter where like, I don't sift my flour anymore. You know, that's just not necessary. So sometimes things get outdated, but that is not, that is not an outmoded 
idea. Okay, so I'll show you what this texture looks like. But when I, so when I did fold it and scrape at the bottom, I did see like a little bit of unincorporated batter. That's why I'm doing that. And now this is what the batter looks like. It's thick, but also super light and fluffy. I don't know if you guys can see. Sorry. Now I'm like really up close. Um, Plus eating batter. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I like kind of, I used to be a big batter eater and then I just stopped because it was like, I just had it around all the time. Sometimes I forget to taste the batter, but you should definitely taste the batter if you don't mind the raw egg, which I don't. You, it's like, ooh, it is good. It is very tasty. I'll eat like, okay. Pizza, though. Like I'll eat any, any raw. <laughs> I don't love all those, but I do really like eating pata shoe raw, which is weird, but I just think it's delicious. So everyone, I was recently having this conversation about like all the weird dough things that people like to eat. Some people like to nibble on raw pie dough, which is not my thing, but I to each his own. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm adding the chopped up pear. So you can see I have my sliced pear here, my chopped up pear here. So add just the chopped pear. And adding fruit like this to a cake, obviously it's adding flavor. When you add fruit like this, whether it's dried fruit, well, I guess not really dried fruit because that would take moisture out. But fresh fruit, when you add it like this, is adding moisture to the cake. And it just means that the cake is gonna keep and not dry out even longer because you have that fruit in there. And it's not a lot. If you were to add too much fruit, sometimes adding too much fruit to a batter, especially if the fruit is, is, is raw or uncooked, um, you can add too much liquid and then your cake doesn't really fully bake through and you have something kind of wet and unappealing, but pear is low moisture. We're not adding that much. That's not gonna happen here. Okay, so fold that in, fold it in. Um, and now our cake batter is done. So there it is in the bowl. Okay, so now this is why we started with a cake pan because now your batter is ready and you have your pan ready to go. So there's no delay. We're gonna scrape everything into the panel. I'm a lefty, but I'll try to switch so you can see me do it. I know we're running a, a tad bit late, which is actually my fault, um, but we're nearly there. So scrape all the batter in. And this mostly fills this pan, this, the Great Jones pan is a nine inch pan, right? And it's nine inches, right? Or is it 10? I think it's nine. Um, but it doesn't overflow. This cake will obviously rise, but it's not because it's a thick batter. It's unlikely to overflow. I've had many, many, many an overflowing cake, which then drips out to the bottom of the oven and burns and makes smoke. Okay, so scrape that batter in. <laughs> um, and now my, I'm a broken record, but my favorite kitchen tool of all time, my little offset spatula, is just the best thing for spreading. And so go ahead and smooth out the surface. You can just use the same flexible spatula as before. Um, because it's a thick batter, it's it's prone to like forming air pockets. So just, you know, be aware of that and smooth it out. Make sure there aren't any big air pockets like in the sides of the pan or anything like that but also like you're not going for perfection because we're covering the top of the cake with more pear. Mm. Just, I worked on this recipe, I think I really finished this recipe about a year ago, it was maybe a little longer. And it's really fun to revisit because I'm just reminded about how much I like it. Just a good feeling. Okay, so the cake batter in the pan, you can see it's full but not overfilled. Like you don't really want to fill a pan more than two thirds to three quarters of the way, depending on the batter. So this is just right. It will rise basically to the top. And now we're going to do the final step, which is arranging our pear slices on the surface. Um, and this part, I think, it's like you want to be artfully sort of haphazard about it. You know, like. I like things to look really natural and not overly 
perfect. You know, like I'm not going to sit here and like make concentric circles or anything, but I, but I like keeping the kind of natural form of the pear. So basically I grab like a little stack of slices and fan them out. And then you just kind of throw them on the top of the cake and let them fall wherever they want to. And I fan them out in a way that the, what would have been the top of the pear near the stem, which is the narrower part, is like that's the part that I'm fanning out. And then where the pear head is based, that's kind of where it's staying together. So I'll take like three or four slices at a time, not more than that, maybe four or five. And just kind of create these little fans. And then in order to keep everything looking kind of just the right amount of arranged, I like rotate the cake pan a little bit. And then, you know, they just get layered on top of each other. And then I just think it ends up looking really, really pretty. So that's kind of fun. And also feel, you should also really overlap them because this is on the top of the cake. It's gonna get a blast of heat from the oven. Um, and so these slices will shrink a little bit. So it might seem like there's a lot of fruit or, you know, there's a lot of overlap, but they'll all kind of shrink. And so you'll end up seeing little areas of the cake popping through. Okay. So I'll try not to take too much time doing this, but you can take your time at home. Like nothing is gonna happen to the batter. It's, it's pretty stable. And then make sure you have that remaining two tablespoons of sugar nearby, because that's gonna go all the way on top. One thing I rediscovered when working on this book is just like what a great garnish plain old granulated sugar is. Because it just, especially with cake batter where you have eggs in it, like there's a cool thing that happens where the sugar on the surface kind of reacts with like the foamy eggs in the batter and makes this crackly, like delicious this sugary top. So I just garnish this with plain old sugar. Okay. So I'm almost done. I have like another half of a pear. Um, so if you have, if you like cover the whole surface and you still have pear left, go ahead and take those slices either one or two at a time and just kind of tuck them in between like any gaps that you see. So you don't have to keep them all intact at that point. It's just can be like, oh, like there's a little space. I'm gonna put two of them right there. There's a little space, I'll put a couple right there. That part can be up to you. Um, I actually, thinking about it, there's no reason why you couldn't do this with Apple if you wanted to make this version again. Apple and another nut, of course. I mean, at that point, it's like kind of a different cake because you're not neither using pear nor chestnut, but the idea is sound and will work if you want to do it that way. Um, okay, so I have just a few slices left. Also, you notice I didn't peel the pear. I didn't peel the pear that was going in the batter or on top. Um, you could peel the pear in the batter, but like the skin kind of breaks down and is totally inoffensive. Um, and of course on top, I like it there because it adds a little bit of color. So you're short on pears. Do you need to cover the whole top to keep mm, it? To you don't pear. have to cover it. I actually, I do like when the cake peeks through. So if that's an aesthetic choice and that could happen if your pear were small or if you didn't cut them super thin, but that's totally fine. Like they'll bake through, they'll get tender. Um, you can fan them out a little bit more or just leave them. And you know, you could do like, you see sometimes those classic French pear tarts where you have like a section of pear in each sort of slice, like, you know, arranged around in a radial pattern, like you could do it that way. Um, it doesn't have to cover the whole surface. So here's what it looks like, I if you can see. So it's like when you, I like it when you can look at a recipe and know what's in it. So like, I know this is a pear cake because it has the unmistakable shape of pears on top. Um, okay, I just got nervous that this isn't sugar, but it is. Okay, so I tasted it. Always, if you're not sure if it's sugar or salt, definitely give it a taste. I've made that mistake before. 
Okay, so this is the final two tablespoons of sugar. And because I want the sugar to cover everything, I kind of hold it up maybe 10 inches or so above the cake. And that's just so the crystals spread out as I shake it. And I'm rotating the pan. So I'm just covering everything. Okay, and now this goes into the oven. We have our oven on 350. That rack is in the center. And I, this cake bakes, it depends on the pan that you're using. As I said, whether it's a, if it's a narrower pan and you have a thicker cake, it'll take a little bit longer. If you're using a wider skillet where the cake is thinner, it'll take a little bit longer. Um, I think the bake time is like 35 to 40 minutes or so. Let me double check that. Um, and I, so I do have a baked version. Obviously everyone at home, if you're baking along, you will not have a cake to taste along with me in a few minutes, but um, set your timer, be aware. Often I know something is done before the timer goes off because of the smell. It smells, you know, like a done cake. And so I check it. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to unmold the one that I made and show it to you. And then Sierra, you and I can answer people's questions about holiday baking if they have questions about this cake or anything else, whether it's cookies or bread or anything, I'm happy to answer um, as I show you the finished cake. So let me know. I'm just gonna double check the bake time because I've forgotten. Uh, the bake time is, what? Oh, that's a different cake. I was like, that's the apple cake is an hour and 20 minutes. I knew that was, that was not right. Oh, 50 to 60 minutes. Okay, so a little bit longer. Thank you, thank you, Sean Martin, 50 to 60 minutes. Okay, um, I'm gonna throw these in there. Wait, someone has a question that I also have. What did you name the new kitten? Oh, the new, the new kitten's name is Archie, cause he's a redhead. So, which is perfect for him. And it took us several days to come up with it. Um, but, then, but then once I thought of Archie, it really stuck. He's, um, He's blind, so we're taking him to a cat ophthalmologist on Tuesday. <laughs> There's a feline, a feline ophthalmologist. And so, be, and he's been, I mean, he was a stray that we picked up. Now, now I'm just talking about Archie. Um, and so we've had to keep him separate from the other cats because he's like getting over a couple of infections. So we haven't introduced him yet and I'm very nervous about it, but um, we're obsessed with him and he's the cutest, sweetest cat. And like, we were not planning on getting a kitten, but then we had to and we're so happy. So yeah, sweet Archie. <laughs> I like that's the question <laughs> that people have. <laughs> that went up fast. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so ask me holiday, well here, do you want me to unmold it now or answer questions? What shall I do? You pick. Choose your own adventure. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you how to unmold it. And then as I'm kind of plating it, Sierra, like ask me questions because I can do both at the same time. Okay. Okay. So this is just a quick note to say, when you think your cake is nearing the point of doneness, here's what you want to look for. I use a cake, an actual cake tester, which is this little wire thing with this handy little plastic handle. But I also keep nearby... Uh, like a little wooden skewer, which is just as good, or a toothpick. So you want to basically, if, if you have to move a slice of pear out of the way, go ahead. But you basically want to go into the center of the cake and press straight down all the way to the bottom. When you pull it out, there should be no wet batter clinging to the tester. It might look a little bit shiny because of the butter and everything in the cake, but there'll be no batter. So that's when it's done. Let it cool completely in the pan. And then you wanna cut around the sides. So I use, you can use a butter knife. I, often, I usually don't use a sharp knife because I don't wanna ding the pan or you know, affect the finish. But you wanna just slice, keeping it flush with the side of the pan, go ahead and cut all the way around, which I've already done. And now I'm gonna unmold it by inverting it pull off the parchment and then I'm going to reinvert onto a serving plate. And now I'm ready to answer all of your holiday questions. Ooh. Okay, so that just came out and actually the parchment stayed in the pan, which is ideal. 
so I don't, don't have to peel it off. Ooh. And voila, right here, it wasn't quite centered. And now we have our beautiful pear cake, which smells so good and I'm excited to eat it and I actually haven't eaten anything today yet. So, all right, let's hear your questions. Okay, we've got, we've got a ton coming in. What okay. recipe from dessert person would you recommend to bake for Hanukkah? Ooh, um, Hanukkah. I mean, the traditional dessert for Hanukkah is soufraniot or the jelly donuts, which I don't have in this book because it's not technically baking. Um, but I would probably just, I guess, I think chocolate because I think of gelt. And there's a really, really lovely flourless chocolate cake in the book, which I actually designed originally to be a Passover cake because there's no dairy and no flour. Um, but that is like a fantastic there's something about that recipe, I think, because I thought about it for Passover that just makes me feel like it's a great holiday recipe. So in the book, it's called the flourless chocolate wave cake because as the cake kind of settles and cools, it gets this like wavy edge, which is really cool. So it's also very straightforward and not, not hard to make. So that's a really good one. What is the best bread to start baking with? I really want to get into bread making. First off, oh. welcome to 2020 to whoever wrote this. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, yes, I, I hear you and I feel you. Um, I highly recommend focaccia. I actually recently had, like I started a dessert person little series on YouTube and the first thing I made with all recipes from the book. And the first thing I made was not dessert, even though it's dessert person series, it was focaccia. And I think it is the ideal starter recipe for bread. It's very hard to mess up and you're baking it in a pan. So you don't have to worry about like forming it or shaping, which can be a little tricky. So, and it uses active dry yeast. You can find it in any grocery store. So there's like three ingredients, you know, it's yeast, flour, water, salt, olive oil. Maybe that, that's five if you count water but, and salt. But anyway, that's a great one. I highly recommend that as, as an excellent place to start for bread baking. Are there any other common instructions in baking recipes that you either take very literally um, or ignore, like the sifted flour? Um, there are certain, and I think about it in terms of language a lot, like there's one instruction that I take very, very literally, which is you sometimes see in what I are called egg foam cakes, where like you, the first step, rather than butter and sugar and creaming that together, you start with the eggs and the sugar and you whip it until it's really thick. And often what you see is the term slowly dissolving ribbon, like beat until you have a, you know, it falls off the whisk into a slowly dissolving ribbon. Um, and I look for that. I literally look, look for it to be like, a, you know, a rope that is like coiling up onto itself as it falls into the pan. So as it falls into the bowl. So, and if it doesn't do it, go longer. So, I, I mean, I guess I take all of it pretty literally. Um, trying to think if there's anything where I just totally disregard. Sometimes, sometimes like, I guess when it, it like challenges my own gut, I'll, I'll disregard, I try to listen to my gut. So if it, cause like sometimes there's errors in recipes. And so it might say like, you know, makes one loaf and I'm making it and I'm like, this is way too much batter for this pan. You know, I think this makes two or something like that. You know, that's when, if it, if it goes counter to my instincts, then I try to question it. And when I don't question it and I do it often, I was right. I was like, I should have, <laughs> should have listened to what I thought initially. Um, so yes, it happens. What recipe are you the proudest of in the book? Um, there's a few that stand out. I'm really proud of the tart tatin recipe because I just feel like it hacks a recipe that I think is like a little unfair to bakers in its, the way that it's presented is that it's very simple and to me it's very hard. And so I'm proud that like, my approach to tart tatin actually makes it 
more doable um, and more approachable for the home baker. Uh, like there's an honesty in it, I guess, is what I like. I'm trying to think of other ones I'm really proud of. Uh, the ones that I'm proud of are the ones to me that tend to be like over deliver and are really at its core, like introduce better results with a simpler process, you know, although I have to say that Tartar Tan doesn't exactly do that, but I'll get back to you about any others that like, you know, check those boxes. All right, I just wanna say that I, I took out a slice. Ooh. So you can see, you can see that there's like little, it's studded with little pieces of pear. And in general, the cake, it stays really moist, which I constantly try to think of another word to say that's not moist, but there is no other word. I'm not gonna say it's like very supple, which isn't always like the best word, but um, it has a really nice crumb, meaning sort of like the, the amount of air and the texture of the cake itself. Um, and I'm gonna do one finishing touch, which is add a little bit of sweet and crumb fresh to it. So, but keep, keep the questions coming because I'm, I'm paying attention and listening. If you have a small kitchen, as so many of us do in New York, what, what's your top baking gear? Um, that's a great question. You know what's really handy is a hand blender. A hand blender can do a lot of things that you wouldn't, that like, where normally a recipe might call for a food processor and or a regular blender. A hand blender can take care of it. And so I'm very often like, using a hand blender in my kitchen instead of a larger appliance because I don't have a lot of space either. It's basically what you're seeing. Um, and also like, because I don't have a lot of counter space, I don't keep my appliances on my counter and I get super lazy about getting them out. And so I just hate the idea of like reaching out and lifting up my mixer or something. So a hand blender can be so useful. Um, and a hand mixer. I've like recently fallen in love again with hand mixers and think that they're super, super useful. So yeah, if you're, if you're low on space, I would say those two tools are, are really, really helpful. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you see my like, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, like, hey, thank you, thank you and go away. Bye. <laughs> um, okay, a great question from Someone is from the Philippines. How cool. Um, thank you for joining us. They're waiting their, for their book to finally arrive this month or next month. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Yes, what, what would you recommend that they bake first considering they're a super beginner baker? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, well, I'll just say that the recipes within all the chapters are organized from sort of easiest to most challenging. So anything that's early on in a chapter, the first you know few recipes, those are going to be the simplest. But I think that for a really novice baker, a, a great place to start is the chocolate chip cookie because there's no special equipment needed. You can just do it with a bowl and a whisk, and it is like a classic baking recipe. So I think that like that's something that I crave and like always want to eat. So it's sort of a good combination of being like. A recipe that really serves you and being easy and just being super delicious. So um, I would start there. I think that's a great one. And I just re realized, by the way, that I have I've had this vanilla creme fraiche sitting in my fridge forever, and I just realized that I'm going to use that instead of a new, new thing of creme fraiche. Um, so that's what I'm going to use. How did you decide what you wanted to base this book on, and which recipes you would use? And my I'll add in my question, which which you've talked about a bit, is like. How do you decide also what to say for the future, for a future book, for a future mm. column? Mm. Um, side note, I just realized that this is cream, cream cheese frosting and not what I thought it was. <laughs> so I'm getting, I'm getting the creme fraiche back out. Um, no, that's a good question. I had to really think about, I had to really build in some parameters for this book because it had to feel coherent. You know, it had to feel like, within the two covers, within the space that I had, I wanted to feel like I gave, I presented something that was like a, a sort of a, a, like an encapsulation of something. Um, so I decided to make it all baking recipes. So there's actually only one recipe in the book and I didn't even realize this until after it was published. There's one recipe in the book that is not actually baked and that's English muffins because they're griddled 
like stovetop, which I didn't even really think about, but everything else is baking. And that's because like that, that idea sort of anchors the book that like everything that's in this book is something that goes into the oven and then comes out. Um, but within that definition, there's quite an expansiveness. There's like savory stuff, there's breakfast recipes. And that part of that was trying to put forth the argument that baking is really flexible and expressive and creative and diverse. Uh, you know, so I was trying to make the argument that baking could be so many things and not just dessert, even though the book is called Dessert Person because that's about like an attitude. So um I, I definitely had a lot of other ideas for different kinds of recipes and my editor, I mean, my editor did a great job at her job, which was to be an editor and tell me, you know, like, I don't really think that this goes. So um, I had to sort of rely on other people to tell me, like, to tell me, to tell back to me what this book was about and let me know when I was getting away from that. So that's why it's helpful to have, because like sometimes you don't have perspective on it yourself. You know, you need someone else to to give that to you. So Yes, that that was very helpful. Everyone, everyone needs an editor. You know, um, it's very, very important. That's great. We've had a, a little bit of it. come in about how substitutable the the recipes in the book are with gluten free flour. Mm. It's a little bit of a case by case basis. Um, anything in like the bar cookie, the blondies, the brownies, and the recipe, all of those work really, really well with substituting gluten-free swap. There are some naturally gluten-free recipes in the book. There's a pavlova, which is meringue. You know, it's all egg, no flour at all. There is a rice pudding cake, which is almost like a custard. So you make rice pudding on the stove and then you beat in some eggs and you bake it in a cake and it turns into this like totally set sliceable cake, but no flour at all. Um, else is in the book that's gluten-free there's oh the flour challenge cake is gluten-free so I tend to like to focus on gluten-free baking where there don't I don't do a lot of gymnastics to get to that to that point it's like there's either a low amount of flour or no flour at all to begin with um if you're in the cakes chapter you're probably pretty safe by in the substitutions um if you're using like a cup for cup or King, Ar you know, King Arthur blend or any of those things. So um, very, very, very good question. And um, it just, I just, full disclosure, it might require a little bit of trial and error. Um, okay, so just before I get to the next question, I'm adding a little bit of the sweet and creme fraiche on top. You could do whipped cream, you could serve it with ice cream, but I like using creme fraiche because it's already in the cake and it has a nice tanginess that I love, so. That's going on there and getting a nice little dribble down the side. Oh. There we go. I'm gonna start eating it while I answer more questions. What did you do actually... you're beautifully haphazard? Uh art artfully haphazard. Artfully. Or, artfully. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. Okay. This... Like, you know, I, like I want it to look on like studied in its unstudiedness, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which is I guess a contradiction, but whatever. <laughs> Okay, this will this will be the last question, though I everyone I appreciate. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. Um, best go to cake for the holidays. If I mean it could be this one, right? Um, let me think. This is I mean this is kind of my favorite time of the year for baking, so I do feel like most of the cakes and many of the pies which to me are the most like festive. Those are the first chapters because those are my favorites. Um, most of them fit really nicely into this time of the year, either because of flavor or ingredient or both. Um, so there's, a, there's just to say that there's a lot. I think that the carrot cake is so delicious and has like the most delicious frosting and is such comfort food. And this is the holidays where like, I don't really care about tradition this holidays. I just want to care. I just care about things that I want to eat. Um, so I would say the carrot cake is just pure comfort food. And I think could be a great choice for this holiday season. Um, what else? Uh, and there's a, there's an apple cake in the book, which I think for the same reason is also one I would really recommend. It's like loaded with fruit. It's, pretty easy. It's like stir together. Um, it's, it's 
the kind of thing you could eat any time of the day. That's just, and like also very comforting for me. So um, those are, those are some great ones and like, you know, relatively easy to make. You have many fans of those recipes in the chat. <laughs> oh, good. The tart was, a hit. <laughs> I mean, I, I said this to you, it's, you're, you're just, you're so exceptional at what you do. And it's so exciting to see people make those recipes and like feel, and, and what we try to do as a brand too, is like build confidence. And I think like the, the precision and the like diligence you put into the recipes, both like the creativity of like how they taste and then being delicious, but also how you teach and like you showcase that today is just, it's just, it's so, it's so confidence building and it's just, yeah, it's very inspiring to see. <laughs> Thank you. That's my goal. I mean, the, the sort of subtitle of the book is, is recipes and guidance for baking with confidence. And that is how I, that's sort of like who I want to be in this space is someone who is trying to like build people up, encourage them to take risks, to like learn something. Um, because like I've experienced that evolution from novice to sort of like, you know, home expert and it's so rewarding. And um, I just think that it's something that people would really enjoy. And so I like to encourage them and it's great to have this forum. Like I love, I love teaching so much and it's so much fun and I love being able to answer people's questions directly. So um, it's a huge pleasure. And of course, to be able to do it, to do it on behalf of God's love we deliver is just makes it like even more rewarding than it already is. So um, I, I love, thank you so much to everyone who came and thank you to Sierra and Reza and Renee Great Jones um, and Natasha and Emma at God's Love. So it's a it's a true pleasure. And like my holidays this year, like a lot of people's are like pretty solitary. And so I just am happy to be able to like connect on Zoom with so many people and have and you know this is like this is a treat for me too. So it's been a, a wonderful pleasure and I hope that everyone's cakes turn out. <laughs> yes. Beautiful, share, beautifully. Share your cakes with us. Also, we are leaving open the Eventbrite. If you feel urged to make any additional donation, all of the, everything goes directly to God's Love We Deliver. And so we're very appreciative of that. That will be open through the weekend. You could also donate directly on God's Love We Deliver site at any point. Um, they do amazing work. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much, Sarah and everyone. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Sorry, we went a little over time. That was my bad. Um, it was great. Thank you everyone for joining us today and hope you have a really safe and healthy and joyful holiday season. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Claire. I love you. <laughs> Did you laugh at that?